West Virginia branch, because that's where I was serving then, Brown Road. And he said that there were kids who were left behind at Christmas time, and they wanted to know if any pastor would be willing to come out on Christmas Day. And I looked around at everybody else sort of looking down and trying to be invisible, you know, how you do when your teacher says, who knows the answer to this? And you're like, please don't see me, please don't see me. And I thought, you know, I don't have a family here right now, so I said, I'll, I'll go. And I got up very early that Christmas morning after going to bed really late Christmas Eve after my three services, and I baked a lot of bread, loaves and loaves of bread, packed up hot loaves of bread, and went to the Board of Child Care. Now, to be a kid who ends up in the Board of Child Care, you're there for one of two reasons. Either your parents can't provide enough for you, perhaps they're in jail or addicted or something like that, and they just cannot take care of their kids appropriately, or you're a kid who has been such a problem that you can't be in school anymore. Because the West Virginia branch of the Baltimore Washington Conference Board of Child Care has a West Virginia public school on the campus. So I went, and there were a handful of kids and a handful of staff. Staff a little bit resentful that they had to come in on their day off, Christmas Day, and be there with these kids. And kids very resentful that everybody else on the planet went home for Christmas, except for them. Now, your family has to be pretty much in a bad state not to even bring you home for Christmas Day. So here I am with my bad attitude and their bad attitudes, but I had bread, and it was hot, and it smelled good. Other than one kid in one of the cottages that I visited, all the kids said the same thing when they saw the communion. They said, what is that? That's very biblical, what is that? You know, that's, that's the de definition of the word manna. That's how it's translated from Hebrew. What is that? Because when... Like we read last week about Moses taking the whining people into the desert, and they said, oh, at least if we were in Egypt, we'd be eating well, we'd be eating well. Why'd you bring us out here to kill us, Moses? And God rains down bread from heaven, the strange, frosty-looking substance that landed on the plants and on the ground and on the rocks, and they picked it up and they tasted it and they ate it, and it was manna, the bread that came down from heaven. But they didn't recognize it as such, and they said, what is that? Manna the bread that comes down from heaven. Now, last week, we read the passage that comes before this, other than that little passage in between. We read about Jesus feeding the multitude. The only miracle, or according to John, sign that appears in all four Gospels and appears six times, which means God wants you to really pay attention to that story. The bread that they ate was barley loaves, little, little loaves of bread. They all recognized it. But Jesus took that small amount and blessed it and shared it, and everyone ate with 12 baskets of leftovers. People who had never had enough to eat in their entire lives, eating to abundance with leftovers. It's an amazing story of God's provision for God's people. It's like grace. It just rains down from heaven. And so we have today, I said there was a little passage in between. That's where they, the crowd disperses and Jesus sends the disciples ahead in the boat, and he decides he's going to rest, he's going to pray, he's going to be alone with his father until there's a little storm out on the lake, and the disciples think they're going to die, and he just sort of walks across the water to them. Very brief explanation of that in John. But now the crowd has gone around the lake, and they come looking for him, and they're saying, how did you get here, Lord? What are you doing here, Lord? And Jesus looks at them and says, just what everyone must have been thinking at the time, you are not here because you saw a sign from God. You're here because your bellies are full, and you want more of the same. And we cannot blame them, can we? Can we really blame them? People who never had enough to eat, eating in abundance. I think I'd have hoofed it around that lake myself looking for a little bit more bread. And Jesus says to them, strange words, work for the bread that endures. And they're saying, where can we get that kind of bread? And he says to them, I am the bread. I'm the bread of life. Strange words, if you aren't used to hearing them. We're used to hearing all those great sayings. This is the first time in John that Jesus will say, I am, of the seven things he says he is. And I won't test you on all of them, but you know them, right? I'm the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the resurrection. I am the vine. You are the branches. That's the last of those sayings. But the crowd is perplexed, and they remind him, well, our ancestor Moses gave manna in the wilderness, that what is it? 
that stuff that they picked up and they ate, and they had their fill of that as well. And Jesus said, it wasn't Moses, not, this is no slight to Moses, he's saying, Moses was doing that on God's behalf. This is my father who feeds you, who is feeding you now, and who will feed you. I want us to leave that aside and look at the epistle lesson this morning from Ephesians, because it's talking about building up the body of Christ. It made me think, bread and bodybuilding, wouldn't it be good if those two things went together all the time? Because if I had to choose one food I could eat the rest of my life, it would be bread and probably my own homemade bread, because I told you before, I make good bread. And if I had a little butter, I would just be in heaven. Not literally, but I'd be as close as you can get on this planet. Now, I did ask this morning at the early service, and Rob back there, who's doing double duty these days, says he has had the pleasure of doing something that I would only dream of called carbo-loading. Any of you runners, marathoners, bikers? Carbo-loading. That is when you are trying to build up the glycogen in your body so your muscles have endurance, and they tell you to do nothing but stuff yourself with carbohydrates. If ever a doctor would say to me, you need to carbo-load, I'd kiss him on the lips. No doctor ever says that to me. In fact, they say, you need to limit your carbs. But you got to understand at home, I don't eat homemade bread very often. I eat bamboo fiber bread with six grams of carbs in a slice. Not the best, not the worst either that I've ever had. But if you're carbo loading, you're supposed to consume between 3,500 and 4,000 grams of carbohydrates in a day. Is that not heaven on earth? Carbohydrates. Now, granted, the next day you got to get up and run a marathon, which I could do if someone chased me with a car and a gun and a couple of dogs, possibly. That might make me run, but nothing else is going to make me run, especially with my knee the way it is. But imagine carbo-loading with the bread of life for a moment, because Paul is talking here to the church in Ephesus about building up the body of Christ. And it goes along with what the people ask Jesus, what must we do? And he says, what are the works? And Jesus says to them, believe in the one God has sent. Not tough work. Well, not at face value, because believing is one thing. But you got to act on your belief. you got to put it into action. And Paul gives us those ways to do it. Because he says, God has gifted us, gifted us, that some should be apostles. Now, we're all off the hook with that one, right? The apostles, the 12 original guys who walked with Jesus and Paul who said, I am an apostle, I am an apostle. He appeared to me. He was resurrected, but he did appear to me. I am an apostle too. And there's a sense of apostolic succession in that God raises up leaders in every generation to lead the church through ordination or consecration. So you're off the hook with that one. But some God called and gifted to be prophets. What is a prophet but someone who speaks the truth for God, speaks the truth in love, speaks the truth with power, speaks the truth to power? And everyone here has a chance to be a prophetic witness for Christ. Evangelists. Now, I'm not talking somebody on television with a wife with a lot of makeup on here. An evangelist is someone who shares the good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ. That's as simple as saying, this is where I was, this is where I am, this is where you could be, come along with me. Some pastors, and you're like, we know who the pastor is. She's the one that gets the paycheck. That's a professional pastor. But the word pastor means shepherd. Shepherd, and you have all shepherded somebody. If you've had a child or if you've been in a room with other people who need your help, you have been a shepherd. And shepherds are not out in the field standing with the staff looking peacefully. Ah, the little white balls of fluff. They're working their heart out. When I was in college, I was an English major. I was in my senior year, and one of my professors begged us, begged those who loved him. We had taken so many classes with him. He wanted to teach in what he had done his PhD in, British literature of World War I. That's the most mind-numbing course I've ever taken in my life. And there were only four of us. So talk about trying to be invisible. You're sitting there going, please don't call on me, sir. And he says, Terry, what did you think of this poem? And I'm thinking, I thought it was the most boring thing I've read, but I'd have to come up with something else to say then. And we were all seniors, which is how he coerced us into taking the course. And at the end of the semester, which was the end of my senior year, he looked at us all and he said, congratulations on this great accomplishment of graduating. He said, you are now qualified to discuss 
discuss Chaucer with anyone. He said, and maybe herd sheep. Well, there was this guy in the class and he said, no, we're not qualified to herd sheep because the summer before he had gone to Canada and worked on a sheep ranch and he said it was the hardest job he ever had in his life. He thought, oh, I'm gonna be a shepherd, I'm gonna sit on the hill and I'm gonna to get to read for the fall. No, he said, the sheep, they butt you every time you turn around, they're knocking you down. They're biting you with their nubby little teeth, they stink. They're not little white balls of fluff, they've got all kinds of nonsense hanging in their wool. And that stick that you get is not to stand there and look pastoral. It's to whack them when they won't go in the right direction and pull them out of trouble when they're over the side of the hill. All of you have had the job of shepherding someone. If you taught anybody to read and write or tie their shoes or use a toilet without help, you have been a shepherd. Then there's also teachers. You know what people say when you say, I'd like you to teach Sunday school? They try that invisible look again. I'm not here, I'm not here, I'm, she's talking to somebody else. People say, I can't teach Sunday school because why? What would a good, I'm gonna ask you all, they get to talk back at the first service, you get to talk, why would somebody say, I cannot teach Sunday school? Because I don't what? I don't know enough. I hear that all the time. I don't know enough about the Bible to teach. The best way to learn anything is to have to teach it to somebody else. And if you taught your child how to drive a car, God bless you, you can teach somebody about the good news of God and Jesus Christ. That's what it is to believe in God, and that's what it is to build the body. I am hoping against hope that one day we will be able to celebrate communion in the way we used to, where I put the bread in your hand. I get to touch your bread. I always sanitize my hands first. And you dip in the cup together and you go back and you share that one loaf and that one body, that sense that we have together that Paul talks about, you know, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one hope, all those things and one loaf that we share together. But I always hated communion services that I'd go to sometimes where the server would hold the bread and you get to pull off your own piece because let me tell you, everybody's on a low carb diet then. People will come up and they'll pull off a micron of bread and I'm thinking, what are you going to dip that in? because it's like you're on a low-carb diet when it comes to Jesus. But that day at the Board of Child Care, everybody got a chunk of bread. And the one kid who had had communion before said to me, is it all right to like it this much? I feel guilty liking it this much. I said, Jesus did not say, this is my Brussels sprout given for you. This is now my body. He took bread. And I bet your stomachs are just beginning to grumble a little bit hearing about so much bread. Maybe your mouths are watering a little bit. Maybe you're going to go home and bake some bread this afternoon. That would be great. Bring me some. Because Gail brought me some jelly this week, and I'd have some bread and some jelly to put together. But that's another story, isn't it? But what if we were to carbo load on the bread of life? What if we were to say when Jesus comes into our lives, yes, Lord, give me your gifts because I will use them. I will put them to use in your kingdom. I will teach, I will prophesy, I will evangelize, I will tell people what you have done in my life. Like I say all the time, the best churches I've ever been to are called AA meetings because people go in there broken and feeling shame and guilt and they're welcomed and they're loved into wholeness, which is also one of the best definitions of evangelism I've ever heard and I've said this before and I'll keep saying it, I don't know who came up with it, but it's great. The best definition of evangelism is one beggar telling another one what? Where to find bread. We've got to admit that we were broken too. Some of us more broken than others still. Which is why the Greek text has this great kind of conjugation of a verb that is something that happened in the past but continues to happen. Resurrection is one of those things. Also, this is the bread that comes down from heaven. This is the bread that God is giving us. It's not something that happened on that hillside 2,000 years ago. God will feed us with the bread so that we are built up together and our body is built in love. In love. Does that mean we're going to agree with each other on everything? Heck no. I know y'all didn't vote for who I voted for in the last election because I read your Facebook pages and your posts and your emails. I know y'all don't agree on whether we should mask or not mask or be together or be separate. I know all those things because we're different people. 
But that's not what unity, unity is not everybody thinks the same thing at the same time. Everybody wants to sing the same music or the same hymn at the same time. I tell you, I've seen churches divide over the color of the carpet. Unity is understanding that what brings us together is so much more powerful than anything that would ever threaten to take us apart from one another. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That is why baptism is a sacrament in the United Methodist Church and even in the Roman Catholic Church. If you go there and you have been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter who baptized you, when, where, how. The Roman Catholic Church accepts your baptism because it is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. All you have to do is believe the one that God has sent. But if you believe, you got to show it. You got to tell others. We've had this pandemic. We're just getting back together in the church again. So many people are missing from us, some because they're afraid to be back yet, some because it's just gotten easier to stay home on Sunday morning and get out of the habit of worshiping together. But there's work to be done. There is such work to be done in the world because people are hungry for literal bread and they're hungry in their souls for the bread of life. So what do you got to do? You got to feed them. Feed them because God has gifted you through the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can go out into the world and do great things. That day at the board of child care, I went in with a heavy heart and I came out feeling better than I had in a long time. Some of those kids had no idea what we had done. Some of those staff people had no idea what they've done. And when I left, because there was a loaf of bread for every cottage I went to, they said, are you going to take the extras? Because there were such a few number of us in each cottage that even with a big chunk of bread, enough to make a sandwich with, they had half a loaf. And they said, what are you going to do with the rest of that bread, lady? I said, I'm going to leave it here for you all. And they said, can we eat it just like bread? I said, just like bread. And they smiled. They didn't know exactly what it was, but they knew it was a good thing, and they knew that they were welcome. And even the staff, some of them, when they got the bread and when I left, said, Amen. Thank you for being here today. Broken people built into a body through the grace and the gifts of a Savior who gives himself to us, not who gave himself for us, who gives himself to us every day. Take and eat and share him with someone who needs to know where the bread comes from. As if you were a beggar, showing another beggar where to find bread. Good bread. Hot, homemade bread. To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We come now to the...